Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for uh, tonight's webinar. My name is Maggie Howell, and I'm the executive director here at the Wolf Conservation Center. Um, some quick, uh, quick tips before we get started. Uh, if you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the Q&A box in your control panel, and we'll provide time for a question and answer session at the end of the presentation. Um, also, a recorded version of the webinar will be available on our website within uh, a day or two. So uh, let's get started. Um, today we're joined by Nadia Hall, who has generously offered her time to discuss uh, policy, how to understand policy and how to protect our most um, at-risk species. Nadia uh, earned her master's in environmental policy from Pace University in 2018, where she studied human wildlife, wildlife conflict and coexistence. She is now the community environmentalist at T-Town Lake Reservation, a 1,000 acre education center and nature preserve. Most recently, her research has focused on the human dimensions of coyote management in suburban areas. Nadia is passionate about conservation of wildlife and wild places through science, advocacy, and environmental education. So without any further ado, uh, let me just make sure she's on. Um, here we go. Uh, we will turn the time over uh, to Nadia. So welcome, Nadia. Hi, can you hear me? Yep. All right, great. Well, welcome everyone, and thanks to Maggie and to the Wolf Conservation Center for having me. In light of the recent proposal to delist gray wolves across the lower 48, this is a timely topic, and we'll be delving into some of that in just a bit. So some of the questions that we'll be answering today are, how does the government create wildlife policy? What is the Endangered Species Act and how does it work? Why is the federal government proposing to delist the gray wolf? And where can I find more information and keep track of legislation? Let's start by talking about why we protect wildlife. The North American model of wildlife conservation was developed over the last two centuries in the US and Canada into the seven principles that you see on the screen. The first one being wildlife is a public resource. In the United States, wildlife is considered a public resource independent of the land or water where wildlife may live. Government at various levels has a role in managing that resource on behalf of all citizens and to ensure the long-term sustainability of wildlife populations. This concept stems from the public trust doctrine, which has its origin in Roman civil law, and it's really the cornerstone of the model. The public trust doctrine establishes a trustee relationship of government to hold and manage wildlife, fish, and waterways for the benefit of the resources and the public. Fundamental to this concept is the notion that natural resources are deemed universally important in the lives of people, and that the public should have an opportunity to access these resources. The government doesn't own the resources, the public does, but the government is entrusted with the care of the resources for the public's long-term benefit. I'll let Theodore Roosevelt sum this up for us by reading a quote from 1916 that still applies today over 100 years later. And that is, defenders of the short-sighted men who in their greed and selfishness will, if permitted, rob our country of half its charm by their reckless extermination of all useful and beautiful things, sometimes seek to champion them by saying that the game belongs to the people. So it does, and not merely to the people now alive, but to the unborn people. The greatest good for the greatest number applies to the number within the womb of time. Our duty to the whole, including the unborn generations, bids us to restrain an unprincipled present day minority from wasting the heritage of these unborn generations. The movement for the conservation of wildlife and the larger movement for the conservation of all our natural resources are essentially democratic in spirit, purpose, and method. So the second principle, markets for game are eliminated. Before wildlife protection laws were enacted, commercial operations decimated the populations of many species. Making it illegal to buy and sell meat and parts of game and non-game species removed a huge threat to the survival of those species. A market in fur bears continues um, as a highly regulated activity, often to manage invasive wildlife. Allocation of wildlife by law. Wildlife is a public resource managed by government. As a result, access to wildlife for hunting is through legal mechanisms, such as set hunting seasons, bag limits, and license requirements. Next, wildlife can only be killed for a legitimate purpose. 
Wildlife is a shared resource that must not be wasted. The law prohibits killing wildlife for frivolous reasons. Wildlife species are considered an international resource. Some species, such as migratory birds, cross national boundaries. So treaties such as the Migratory Bird Treaty recognize a shared responsibility to manage these species across those national boundaries. Science is the proper tool for discharge of wildlife policy. In order to manage wildlife as a shared resource fairly, objectively, and knowledgeably, decisions must be based on sound science, such as annual population surveys and the work of professional wildlife biologists. We'll see how this principle is or isn't applied in just a bit as we discuss the Endangered Species Act. And finally, the democracy of hunting. In keeping with democratic principles, government allocates access to wildlife without regard for wealth, prestige, or land ownership. So now we're gonna look at the policy cycle and see how laws get passed. It's all going to sound very neat and clean at first, but I assure you it's much more messy and rarely follows these steps without a bunch of back and forth. So we'll start with agenda setting. This is where we recognize an issue and decide that something should be done about it. If we think that a solution can be accomplished through a new law or maybe the modification or amendment of an existing law, the interested party uh, can move on to the next step and write the policy. In policy formation, uh, this can be accomplished by anyone, but it's usually written by a lawyer or a group of lawyers within the government or externally by a think tank type organization. At this point, the proposed legislation will need a sponsor, uh, preferably as many as possible, to move it forward for a vote in one or both houses. Moving on to decision making, um, if it passes in one house, it will move to the other and ultimately land on the president's desk to hopefully be signed into law and not vetoed. But this is also where things get really messy. The bill will go through many changes and go through many committees and maybe get tossed out or tabled for a later time. If it does make it through, however, someone then has to translate that legal document into an actionable plan. Most wildlife laws will be sent to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to sort out. Laws are often purposely left vague to appease the representatives that are voting on it, so the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service will have to make heads or tails of it and assign staff, promulgate regulations, and figure out how to enforce the law. Finally, if uh, someone needs to see if the law is working as intended, for wildlife laws, this might mean conducting population surveys and determining if population goals have been met or whether the population is generally trending up or down. If everything is working as intended, great, they'll continue monitoring. If not, the law may need to be amended, in which case we start over and around and around we go. So I said the US Fish and Wildlife Service is responsible for most wildlife management, but let's take a look at what that actually means. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is housed in the Department of the Interior. In 1789, the U.S. government only had three executive departments. Those were the Foreign Affairs, or what we now call the State Department, uh, the Treasury, and War. By 1849, we realized that we really needed to handle our internal affairs in one place, and so we managed, we uh, passed a bill to create the Department of the Interior. While the department functioned for a while as sort of a catch-all of government activities, it quickly began to take shape as a protector of public resources. And in 1872, Congress established Yellowstone as the first national park, which would be managed by the Department of the Interior. It actually wasn't until 1940 that the Fish and Wildlife Service was officially established by combining the former Bureau of Fisheries and the Bureau of Biological Survey. Now, remember when I said that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service was responsible for most wildlife management? Well, marine mammals are actually managed not by the interior, but by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. But for our purposes today, we'll be focusing on the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Before we get on to the Endangered Species Act, I want to take a moment to introduce you to the heads of these departments. David Bernhardt is the Acting Secretary of the Interior, a post which he took on after former Secretary Ryan Zinke resigned in December. Prior to this, he worked in the oil, gas, and coal industries, and there has been some concern about conflict of interest since he previously lobbied for these companies to have access to public lands. Margaret Everson is 
is the deputy director of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. She's been in and out of government work for quite a few years, uh, but most recently she was the chief policy officer or lobbyist for Ducks Unlimited, which advocates for the conservation of wetlands and other waterfowl habitats so that duck populations flourish for the benefit of duck hunters. In her role as deputy director, she is tasked with many things, including enforcing federal wildlife laws, protecting endangered species, managing migratory birds, restoring nationally significant fisheries, conserving and restoring wildlife habitats such as wetlands, helping foreign governments with their international conservation efforts, and distributing hundreds of millions of dollars through its wildlife, sport, fish, and restoration program in excise taxes on fishing and hunting equipment to state fish and wildlife agencies. Now we're going to start talking about the Endangered Species Act and its relationship with wolves. I want to draw your attention to 1969, the same year of our first Earth Day, when we passed the National Environmental Policy Act. This was and is an incredibly important piece of legislation. It says that any project funded or approved by the government must assess its environmental effects before moving forward. After 1973, when the Endangered Species Act was passed, this meant projects needed to consider wildlife and their habitats in their project area as well. And in 1978, we saw the power of this law in action. The Tennessee Valley Authority wanted to construct a big dam, but there was a problem, a tiny little problem called the snail darter. The snail darter is a little fish and it was recently listed as endangered and successfully blocked the completion of the dam when a case went to the Supreme Court. And this was a big deal and set a big precedent moving forward. Um, moving forward a few years to 1982, I also want to mention that the Endangered Species Act was amended to include the 10J rule, which allowed the Department of the Interior to classify reintroduced populations as experimental and non-essential. This wasn't a scientific amendment so much as a political one, as it softened protections for certain populations, like wolves, to make it more palatable to those in opposition. So what is the Endangered Species Act? Well, at its core, it's a conservation program to protect threatened and endangered species of plants and animals, as well as the habitat in which they are found. And it regulates what you can and cannot do with these species. Of particular importance is the concept of take. The act prohibits the take of any illicit species, so they had to define what that meant. And they said that it meant to harass, harm, pursue, hunt, shoot, wound, kill, trap, capture, or collect, or attempt to engage in any such conduct. But now it says harm. What does harm mean? If you're in a court and you need to say, I did or did harm something, the court needs something to rely on. So they had to define that as well. And they said that that meant an act which actually kills or injures wildlife. Such an act may include significant habitat modification or degradation where it actually kills or injures wildlife by significantly impairing essential behavioral patterns, including breeding, feeding, or sheltering. Now they also define endangered and threatened, which set different levels of protection, endangered carrying more protection than threatened. The import, export, interstate, and foreign commerce of listed species are all generally prohibited as well. Congress said that these protections were necessary due to their value to the American people. They wrote that these species of fish, wildlife, and plants are of aesthetic, ecological, educational, historical, recreational, and scientific value to the nation and its people. Take note that the economic value is not listed and is therefore not a consideration in determining whether a species will be listed. So how is a species listed? Well, either an external or internal argument will be made for listing. This may involve a petition signed by citizens and scientists being submitted to the government describing the urgent need for protection. Uh, once this status review is initiated, the Fish and Wildlife Service will discuss the submission and determine whether there's something to it. Um, if there is, they'll initiate a full status review, which involves the collection of the best available science. Critically, the government is under no obligation to produce research if there is none or if it's lacking, but they do need to look at all available science without picking out select studies that may support their desired outcome. 
After all of this, they'll see what they have come up with, and if listing seems warranted, they'll publish a proposed rule, and the document will be available for public comment so that you, me, and everyone else has the opportunity to provide input, much as is currently the case with the proposed WOLF delisting. They do have to comb through each comment uh, that's left and provide a response, but because they receive many of the same types of comments, they will discuss the broader concepts rather than individually responding to thousands of comments that they receive. Uh, finally, they'll submit a final rule listing a species if they don't have any changes to make. And then once they list it, uh, they'll have to designate the species critical habitat. And what that means is within areas occupied by the species, biologists will consider the physical or biological features that are necessary for the species life processes. These can include space for individual and population growth and for normal behavior, cover or shelter, food, water, air, light, minerals or other nutritional or physiological requirements, sites for breeding and rearing offspring, and habitats that are protected from disturbance or a representative of the historical, geographical, and ecological distributions of a species. They may also include areas that are not currently occupied with species, but may be needed for its recovery. But note that here, economic concerns can be considered in determining critical habitat. Delisting or downlisting is a very similar process, uh, which involves a five-factor analysis meant to determine whether a species is still at risk for extinction. So you can see it looks very much the same, except for this five-factor analysis in the middle. And that looks like this. So looking, is there a present or threatened destruction, modification, or curtailment of the species habitat or range? Um, is the species subject to overutilization for commercial, recreational, scientific, or educational purposes? Is disease or predation a factor? Are there inadequate existing regulatory mechanisms in place outside the Endangered Species Act, uh, taking into account the efforts by the states and other organizations to protect the species? Um, or are there other natural or man-made factors affecting its continued existence? Now there's another sneaky way in which a species can be delisted. It's a very non-scientific and very political way known as a policy rider. A rider is kind of what it sounds like. It's an additional provision added to a bill that isn't really connected to the subject matter of the bill. So it's kind of riding the policy. They're often added to large budget bills uh, where they can be kind of tucked away as often happens to the gray wolf. These are used as political tools of give and take between the parties to earn support and ultimately a vote for whatever bill it's in. And there are two types of riders, lawmaking and limiting. We'll look at an example of each. So this is an example of a lawmaking rider. It says that before the end of the 60 day period beginning on the date of enactment of this act, the Secretary of the Interior shall reissue the final rule published on that date. And so what that means is effectively delisting the wolves in the Western Great Lakes and Wyoming by reissuing that rule. So it's creating law. The other type is limiting. So for instance, this says from 2018, none of the funds made available by this act may be used by the Secretary of the Interior to treat any gray wolf in any of the 48 contiguous states or DC as an endangered species or threatened species under the act. So what that's saying is you're not technically taking away uh, its listing, but you're making it so that no money can be used towards its protection, which is effectively delisting it still. All right, so I'm not going to read everything on here, but this is just an abridged version of the listing and delisting history of the gray wolf. I just kind of want to show you what a mess the history is um, in the United States. And again, to be clear, this is a heavily abbreviated version, um, but it shows you how contentious the issue of wolf conservation has been since their initial listing and still is today. Okay, so now that we have a bit of background in the matter, let's talk about the current proposal to delist gray wolves in the lower 48. Again, this won't, uh, if it did go through, it will not affect the Mexican gray wolf or the red wolf. All right, so for reference here is where we are in the process currently. This is taken from the delisting or downlisting graphic that we just stared at with the yellow arrow uh, pointing to where we are right here. 
The proposed rule is open for public comment, so I encourage you to share your thoughts, um, as is your right to do. Um, and we'll show you, I'll show you a bit more in a moment about how to do that. Here's the current status of gray wolves in the lower 48. By the way, we're talking about the lower 48 because there are no wolves in Hawaii and Alaska has maintained a healthy wolf population that has not required protections under the act. So as of today, wolves across the country are listed as endangered, aside from in Minnesota, where they've been listed as threatened, a slightly downgraded level of protection. After we hunted wolves to near extinction, there was still a small population in northern Minnesota uh, made possible through the movement of wolves from Canada down into the most northern reaches of Minnesota. You can also see in light gray, uh, the current legal boundary of the northern Rocky Mountain distinct population segment of wolves. It also shows in dark gray, the Mexican wolf non-essential experimental population boundary, uh, but they again are not affected by this proposal. So basically this map would be erased and gray wolves would be delisted across the board. How did they come to this conclusion? Well, remember that five factor analysis I mentioned before? Well, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service went through the analysis and determined that there was no significant threat to the survival of gray wolves in the lower 48. Their full justification is available in the Federal Register for you to read, which I'll show you how to get to in a minute. And again, I encourage you to read that. The main threat was determined to be human-caused mortality. However, while this agency expects that human-caused mortality will increase uh, right after listing, they also assert that the state agencies are capable of adjusting their plans to achieve their management objectives, which is wi widely debated. All right, I pulled out just a bit of that justification here for us to look at. And so in part, what it says that are that wolves in the Great Lakes area now greatly exceed the recovery criteria for a secured wolf population in Minnesota and a second population outside consisting of 100 wolves for five success, successive years, excuse me. Uh, therefore, based on the criteria set by the Eastern Wolf Recovery Team, the Great Lakes area now contains sufficient wolf numbers and distribution. Threats have been alleviated and the states and tribes are committed to continued management such that the long-term survival of the wolf is ensured. We conclude that there are no portions of the gray wolf entity for which both, one, gray wolves may be in danger of extinction or likely to become so in the foreseeable future, or two, the portion may be significant. So what does that mean for wolves? Well, first and foremost, Indians management now falls into the hands of the states. The states that have wolf populations have not necessarily proven themselves to be good stewards of a recovering wolf population. Rather, these states plan to open hunting seasons on the wolves and many expect to see their wolf population decrease in the years following delisting. In the Western Great Lakes region, Minnesota's plan calls for a minimum of 1,600 wolves, while Wisconsin and Michigan have far lower minimums at just about 350 and 200. The plans typically divide the states into zones or regions with different population expectations for each, with more rural areas typically carrying more wolves uh, than the more populated or road heavy areas which would carry far fewer protections. The Rocky Mountain states have similar plans while California and the Pacific Northwest are following suit now that wolves have begun to venture across state lines. Opponents of the delisting are extremely concerned, not only because of the loss of protection in their current range, but also because it will limit further range expansion and limit the wolf's ability to establish populations in areas where they are present, but not yet stable. Wolves today are only in a fraction of their historical range, which stretched from California to Maine. And those who see opportunities for further dispersal and recovery, particularly in the Southern Rockies and in the Northeast, states view the delisting as disastrous. The Fish and Wildlife Service claims they never intended for wolves to spread, but that they were listed across the lower 48 out of convenience rather than the agency's intention of fostering their dispersal. They also clarify that they do not require that wolves expand into their historical range for them to be considered recovered. And this is one of those things that if this proposal did go forward, there would likely be um, quite a, few lawsuits that would challenge that. So what can you do? What can you do if you feel strongly either in favor of or opposed to the proposed delisting? A few things. First and foremost, I'm going to again encourage you to leave a public comment on the proposed rule. 
comments received or postmarked on or before May 14th will be accepted. And again, I'll walk you through how to do that in just a moment. You can also contact your representatives and let them know how you feel. As with all comments, while it's great to make an emotional plea, uh, the more scientific information and justification that you're able to provide in your comment, the more helpful it is to the representatives or the agency and the more likely it is to have an impact. Lastly, please share the information that you find with your friends and family and start a conversation on the subject. And I would be remiss if I didn't remind you to make sure that you are getting your information from reputable sources like the Wolf Conservation Center. So now I'm gonna walk you through the federal register. So let me get out of the presentation and move over here. So if you go to federalregister.gov, you will pop up with this page. And from here, you can look at a number of things. You can click onto this tab for the environment and see what some of uh, the most recent proposed rulings. So rules, proposed rules, notices, or presidential documents. For our purposes today, I am going to type in wolf because I happen to know that what I'm looking for will pop up first. But also if you want to look for gray wolf, red wolf, type in any sort of keywords, uh, whether it's about wolves or any other topic, it should all pop up. And then you can refine your search based on publication date, type, agency, things like that. But I'm looking for this right here, which is this first link. So I'm gonna open this up. And it's going to show me a few things. It's going to give me a summary. It's going to tell me what agency is involved. It's going to give me information on public comment. And if I scroll down a bit more, a bit more, it's going to give me a table of contents uh, for all the information that you could want about this. And so I, again, I encourage you to look through whether there's a specific topic that you're interested in, or you have the time to read through all the pages like I did. Um, to get some more information because they have information on the individual state plans, what those look like, what those numbers are, and how they came to those conclusions. But if we return now to the top of the page, we see this submit a formal comment. So if you want to submit a comment, you'll click that. It will load a comment form and this is where you're able to do that. You'll fill out your information and you'll submit it below. If you're also interested, right now there are about 503 public comments and you can read those as well. So you can see what other people are saying. So it's going to warn me that I'm leaving Federal Register and I'll hit continue. And it will load. Okay, and now here it's going to list all of the other comments. So you are free to look at them as well, ones that are in favor, ones that are opposed, and read through what some other people are saying. So for instance, if I wanted to click this one, I can see the full comment and see all that information. So similarly, when you submit yours, it will be available for people to see. All right, and with that, I will turn it back over to Maggie. So thank you all. Thank you, Nadia. Um, so uh, we'll go ahead and take some questions now. Uh, for those of you who joined after the introduction, we're here with Nadia Hall, and she just finished her talk about policy, understanding policy, and how we protect our most at-risk species. And we've been uh, reviewing um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife's proposal to delist gray wolves, uh, or most gray wolves, uh, in the lower 48 states. Okay, so let me look at the questions. Um, let's see, we've got a few here. Um, is it possible to ask U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to extend the comment period? Right now, it's a 60-day comment period. Yes. So you can ask, there's no guarantee that they will, but if they hear from enough people uh, that there's a reason to extend it, then it's very plausible that they would. Again, and this is a more contentious issue, so they might want to keep it as short as possible for themselves. But again, with something like this, because it's so public and there are so many uh, really energized people on the topic, if enough of you do say something, then there's a good chance that they would extend it. Okay. 
Um, do we know what metrics uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service used to determine the species was no longer at risk? So they had a number which was based, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but they they were based on studies. They are, um, I find by the time they get to the policy, a mixture of science and uh, political will to get them to where not only will the species hopefully be okay, but it's a number that the public can work with. Again, they're supposed to only be paying attention to the science. So that's something where if any of you are able to look through and find a discrepancy or find something that they might not have looked at, find a reason why their number is not sufficient, then that can be and should be something that you include in your comment. Um, but they should be basing it off of population surveys and what they consider within uh, the size of the habitat that it can support. Sorry about that, I was on mute. Um, who makes the final decision on delisting, the White House or the agency? So that would be the agency. Okay, and um, does US Fish and Wildlife Service have to respond to everybody's comment? So yes and no. Yes, they do have to respond and read everybody's comment, but because of the sheer volume of comments and because for the most part, a lot of the comments are going to be very similar, whether that's because they're taking the same text suggested by an organization and submitting that, or because the same general types of questions will come up, they will categorize them. So they'll say a bunch of people asked this question, asked X question, Y question, Z question, and then they'll go through and they will answer those questions in depth and they give their justification for either looking into it more or why they're satisfied with their current answer. Got it. Um, can people who are not U.S. residents submit comment? Great question. Um, no. Unfortunately, uh, it really comes down to uh, the constituents that the representatives and that the agency care about. So particularly if you live in, say, Minnesota or Great Lakes region or northern Rocky Mountains or the Pacific Northwest, uh, reaching out to your representatives to do something is going to mean a lot more than it necessarily would for someone, say, in New York to do that just because we're not living in the places where those things are. Now that's not to say it's not important for everyone across the country to uh, submit their opinion, or even if you're outside of the country, potentially to contact an organization and see what you can do. Um, but generally it's going to come down to the constituents who are directly involved in this. So in this case, it's federal, so it'll be across the country. Uh, but if it's a specific state plan, say, that you're taking issue with, it's going to mean a lot more coming from a Wisconsin resident for a Wisconsin plan than it would anyone else, for better or for worse. Okay, there are a lot of questions, Nadia. Um, <laughs> are there studies that consider how delisting would affect wolf numbers based on current data from states where, wolf, where some hunting is permitted, like Minnesota? There are some good studies off the top of my head. I can't give you any, um, but there are some really good ones out there that both support and don't support uh, what they're saying. It's part of the problem is that they're not, the, the big issue is whether or not wolves should be spread across the country and continue to inhabit their historical range or whether like the agency says they should just, they're okay where they are, they pro the population will probably remain relatively stable and that's all we're going for. So depending on what a study is looking at, whether it's looking to expand it or whether they're looking at just maintaining a population in a smaller area, um, we'll define what those numbers look like. Okay, and would it help to also contact uh, one senators or representative? Absolutely. It, it's incredibly important to contact them, let them know what your concerns are. Um, if you're able to go and meet with them in person, that's always even better if you can bring some materials for them uh, that say maybe some of the information that you've found, some of the wolf numbers, your concerns, the questions that you'd like them to look into, and why that's important to you as a constituent, and why that's important to you in the area that you're living. Um, that's really critical. 
Here's another. Um, is scientific and commercial data weighed evenly? Yes. So supposedly these should be neutral studies um, and they often, because of the nature of studies and studies need funding, a lot of them are commercial because these big commercial companies are the ones that have the money to fund the studies. So they do use both. Uh, of course, hopefully there's uh, the least amount of bias as possible. Obviously that's not always true, but yes, they carry the same weight. This is a follow-up to that one. Um, do they release the commercial uh, data that they're using? Yes, if they're using it, then it should be publicly accessible. Absolutely. That might mean, um, I'm not sure, it might mean that you need to request it. You might not be able to just Google it, but yes, it should be available to the public. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm just so many, I'm trying to sort through them. <laughs> um, uh, Are there any other types of wolves on the endangered species list? Yes, so we have a subspecies of the gray wolf, which is the Mexican gray wolf, and we have the red wolf, which is recently more and more so, a recent study also supported the fact that the red wolf is a distinct species, uh, more than it is necessarily a gray wolf coyote hybrid, and so those are also listed. All right. Um, has a similar delisting uh, happened with any other species and with what result? So the big, um, for proponents of delisting, one of the things that they often say is that this is a major victory for the Native Species Act because the ultimate goal should, of course, be always delisting species once they are recovered because that means that it was a success. Um, in other cases, it has worked. So the bald eagle is a really good example of something that was critically endangered and now has been uh, delisted across the entire United States and is pretty well recovered. The bald eagle also has other protections, including the Bald and Golden Eagle uh, Protection Act, which gives them effectively the same protections that they had under the Endangered Species Act still. Uh, so so you can't harass or harm or kill them or really move their nests at all. So while they are recovered and delisted, they still are retaining the protections that the gray wolves would not be retaining once if they were to be delisted. Okay, um, this is a longer one. Uh, my question is, if gray wolves are delisted, how will that impact hunting seasons and or kill quantities? Another question I have is what level of influence, based on your knowledge, does the Bureau of Land Management influence this? Ranchers seem to really want this. Lastly, oh, she snuck in a lot of questions into one question. <laughs> uh, according to the North American Model of Wildlife Conservation Criteria, what does the government say is a legitimate reason for killing gray wolves, especially in comparison to other wolves that seems highly inconsistent? Right. Okay. I'm going to try to remember yeah, There's this. a lot there. So if you need me to repeat well, something, let me know. Uh, certainly for ranchers, it is a big issue because they feel that when the wolves come in, which they do sometimes uh, take some of their cattle and kill them, that that's a major economic loss to them over time. And so there are some ways that the government already uh, fixes that by giving them full market price for any wolves that are taken. Uh, but certainly that's something that is supported by that community. The Bureau of Land Management, um, I'm not sure how much influence they have. I think that's probably all part of the same school of thought about delisting. Um, as far as the North American model of conservation and what's a legitimate reason that would be in many cases uh, if it took either a cattle or a domestic pet or harmed a human, any of those things might warrant a uh, killing by the state or by a private citizen. Did that answer all of that or did I miss anything? I think that's pretty close. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, oh, here's one. Um, when did they release who it was on the scientific panel? That's I guess a good peer reviewers. Question. I don't have that off the top of my head, um, but I'm also interested. So that's something that I'll be looking up as well. And this is related. 
Um, is there always a comment period reopened after the peer review is released? So the, there can be multiple public comments if uh, there are changes to the proposed rule. Um, all documents should be available for the public to view before a public comment period is closed. Um, so hopefully that will fall within that same period of time. But again, if, if it came out at a point at which people felt that there was too little time, only a matter of days left or a matter of a week left, then that would be a justification for calling for an extended common period as well. Okay, if we lose uh, federal ESA protections, uh, can states still protect the gray wolf um, on a state by state basis? Absolutely. Um, any state can, uh, for instance, because the gray wolf is listed federally, it's also listed in New York State, for instance. Um, and that could potentially change if, if they were delisted federally, but every state can. So the states that where wolves currently are each uh, have a management plan in place. And then that's just a matter of what level of protections they want to give them, how they want to work with them to maintain a population, but not upset their residents, things like that. But each state, uh, whether they have wolves or not, is more than welcome to create their own management plan. This is related. Um, are historical records of state management of wolves considered by U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service? Uh, yes. So uh, there has been delisting in a number of the Rocky Mountain states in the past. Uh, Wyoming has been particularly bad with their plans, and so often when the management's been turned over to those states, uh, the federal government has to retain Wyoming's protections because they haven't been able to come up with a good enough plan. Uh, so yes, they are taken into consideration, but clearly as this is the case here, despite Wyoming and the Rocky Mountains and some of the Great Lakes, Lakes states uh, past management plan blunders or failures or inadequacies, they're still moving forward with it. Okay, who is actually driving the delisting? It seems this all came up under Trump, President Trump. Certainly, with each administration, despite um, a process that should be purely scientific, there are priorities. Um, and with this administration, there is a priority for private landowners um, in certain industries, which may um, direct some agencies to act in a certain manner. But I think there are also a lot of really good people working in these agencies who care a lot about the wildlife. Um, it's not just a bunch of evil people sitting in a room. And so everyone's working to make this work for everybody. And again, that's why public comments are so important because it tells them what's important to you and it helps them um, if they missed something or if they can look deeper or at something in a different way. So again, I encourage you to leave a comment. Definitely. Um, and how does this new proposal affect gray wolves in national parks, such as Yellowstone and Isle Royal? So national parks, you still can't hunt or do things like that. So they'll be protected within the boundaries as they are now, for now. Sorry about that, I was muted again. Um, <laughs> do Native American reservations slash tribes have a say with what happens with wolf populations on their land? So that's a great point, and yes. So when we talk about delisting and the management plans within the state, it's not only the states, but it's any of the uh, tribal governments that are living there as well. So for instance, now it's escaping me, but for one of the Great Lake states, they're population goal minimum numbers are actually based on wolves outside of the reservations and their borders. So within the reservations, they have their own management plans that they're developing, um, their own minimums, and so the state minimum is based on outside of that reservation. So there may be many more within the reservation, but for, so they'll count the 350 outside of, towards the state. Okay, I assume the delisting of grizzly bears went through a similar process. Um, that was then blocked by a court decision. Might the wolf gambit take a similar track? It certainly could, and I expect that there will be many lawsuits and this won't be a simple 
you know, 40 more days of the public comment, and then there's a final rule. I expect there to be many lawsuits. It's going to take a long time. And this is the third time, I believe, in recent memory that uh, the, the federal government has attempted to delist gray wolves, uh, the last being under the Obama administration. So there's a good chance that it, it may not happen anyway. It's my understanding there's legislation that's also looking to remove protections from wolves in a few states. Um, why would legislators do that if there's a nationwide delisting proposal by U.S. Fish and Wildlife? Mm, I don't know the details, but my guess is it shows where the state stands on that. So if they're able to pass that, it might not be able to delist them if there's still federal protections, but, it, but it's showing uh, what their constituents feel and telling the federal government that. Okay. Um, isn't there plenty of habitat left in the U.S. where wolf populations could thrive? Southern Rockies, East Coast, East Coast to name a few? Absolutely. So uh, historically, they believe that the gray wolves were from all the way from California up to Maine. And so when they were looking in Michigan, they needed to establish a second population for the Great Lakes. And so one of their options was Michigan, which is what they went with, but they were also looking at two other locations, including the Adirondacks in upstate New York and a portion of Maine. And so they ended up going with Michigan, uh, but certainly there are other locations that are not road dense um, that, that wolves could survive in and thrive in for that matter. Okay, um, did U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service count the most recent, quote, takes um, from this year's hunts? I'm not sure of that answer, um, but it's a great question. Again, if you open up the Federal Register and you look through, they do have um, the information that they utilized in there, and that may answer your question. Okay. Um, why do you think so many attempts have been made at the federal level to delist the gray wolf? Does it have to do with agriculture, cattle ranching interests? Certainly, um, it absolutely does. And so it's been a long back and forth of conservationists and environmentalists who would like to see the wolf population spread and the ranchers who live there um, that are under the impression that the wolves are a detriment to their livelihood. So it, it's, it's a constant battle back and forth, and I expect that that would continue into the future. It's the same um, with all predators, including the way that the bald eagles were <clears throat> persecuted and, and killed for a long time for being predators that might take small lambs and things like that. So it's, it's, it's basically the same way with, with all predators across the U.S. Okay, you mentioned earlier uh, something about non-essential and essential. Could you explain again the difference? Sure, so that's a good question. There are a number of things which I kind of glazed over because I didn't want to bore you all with a million details and get sidetracked. But these are again designations that the government created in order to be less scientific and more political. And so what these say is that they might be able to try a population in a certain area, uh, but that if it doesn't work out, that they can pull them back out. That's something that we've seen with the red wolves on the East Coast, is that they are in one of those designations. And so if it doesn't work out, like some are arguing it's not, that they can uh, be pulled out and, and either restarted somewhere else or held in captivity until they can figure out what to do next, but they are allowed to do that. Otherwise, if it was a, a normal case and a normal population without that designation, they would have to leave them there. Okay, so I'm going to wind things down. Here's, a, um, make this the last one. Um, where did it go? Oh, what happens if a state, um, uh, hunts wolves below that number that you put up. So I guess this is the question talking about the uh, the Great Lakes and what the um, hunting or what the so, population right. could be. Yeah. 
if if they did hunt to a number that brought them below their minimum, uh, then they would likely change their the rules on hunting for a few years. This is something that so after a species is delisted, which is a good point. So I'm glad that whoever thank you for bringing that up. Uh, the, they will be reviewed if a species is delisted um, after five years to see if there were any critical hits, if there are these threats that weren't recognized or they are decreasing in population much, much faster than expected so that they can be relisted. And so a similar thing happens in the state where there are these checks and balances. They do expect um, a, their minimum number of wolves for X number of years, and they will check periodically and make sure that that is heading in the direction that they want, and they will modify their plan as they go to make sure that they are hitting their goals. Great, and I lied, one more. <laughs> <laughs> um, going back to the bald eagle delisting example, uh, was the special protection established before or after the bald eagle was removed from the Endangered Species Act? So that the bald eagle, the bald and golden eagle protection act was in place prior to delisting, uh, quite a bit prior. It started out as just the bald eagle protection act, and later the golden eagles act added. Um, I don't remember the exact year, but it, it, it preceded it by quite a few years. Okay. Well, it looks like we've covered a lot of questions, Nadia. Um, thank you. Thank you. Is oh, there anything you. else you wanted to cover before we wrap up? I would just encourage everyone uh, when they do come in, because I expect you all to, uh, that you really look at the science and make a meaningful comment. Uh, because while the emotional pleas are very important and it really does uh, tell them where you're coming from, it can really make a difference if you're providing them with the types of science that you believe um, are important and should be applied to the situation. And it will um, inevitably have much greater sway if, if you write it in that way. So do the research, reach out to places like the Wolf Conservation Center uh, with your questions so that you can create a, a solid comment for the agency to review. Okay, thank you. And actually, I, I'm, I'm terrible. I'm going to ask a question <laughs> right now. Um, so in, in light of, you know, using science and, and to support your, your comment, Mm -hmm. Would what about um, supporting your comment with commercial data? Is that something that people should consider if they live in a town where, for example, wolf watching is something that can benefit their business? Absolutely. So additionally, aside from all that we've talked about, it's great to frequent the areas that have wolves and tell them that you are there because you support the wolves and you're there to watch them as wildlife. Certainly commercial data, I think that some people might be surprised when they look up the studies that they don't think are commercial and see where the funding's come, coming from that many of them are. Uh, so any data that you come across, as long as it's peer reviewed, um, I would use to justify your opinion. Awesome. Well, Nadia, thank you again. This has been very informative and um, we really appreciate uh, you offering this to us. And for everyone else joining us, thank you very much for being here. Um, if you'd like to learn more about uh, the Wolf Conservation Center or this delisting proposal, um, we do have a link to the Federal Register um, on our website. Uh, but please visit our website. It's just www.nywolf.org. And again, Nadia, thank you so much for offering your time tonight. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Maggie. All right. Good night, everyone.